In ancient times, scientists put forth competing theories on the true nature of light. Scientists settled on the belief that light is energy that emanates from a light source, namely the sun. However, whether it was a wave or particles still had to be tested. It was finally experimentally decided that light contains electric and magnetic particles in motion that when accelerated creates a wave. Waves are the oscillations, the back and forth movement, around fixed locations which allow for energy to be transferred from one point to another. The distance from one wave to the next is called a wavelength, and this is the mechanism by which light is made visible. The distance between wavelengths determines the colors we see. Accordingly, waves oscillate at a right angle from the direction of the acceleration called transverse vibrations. Other types of transverse vibrations are water and sound. However, it is said that waves should not be able to travel through empty space. Since other waves required a medium to travel, it was believed light should as well. Scientists pondered what substance could be capable of carrying light waves. While some believe light was composed of matter in the form of indivisible atoms, others, such as French philosopher and mathematician René Descartes, began postulating about an invisible and infinite substance called the luminiferous ether, which acted as that medium. It was a substance unlike terrestrial elements. It had no physical qualities and was thought to be the primogenial essence, meaning firstborn or first of all, that makes up the celestial world or the heavens. Luminiferous comes from the word meaning light bearing and ether from the Homeric Greek means pure, fresh air or clear sky. This substance known as the fifth element or quintessence was the hypothetical form of dark energy. Since the 1990s, dark energy was believed to be the cause of our expanding and accelerating universe. It has a constant energy density and unlike ordinary matter cannot be diluted by the expansion. Tibetan Tantras relate the fifth element to the most immaterial qualities of existence, the place where the organ of universal consciousness resides. It is the highest of all elements. This oddly sounds similar to the words of scripture, which of course many modern scientists deny. In Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters. Scripture reveals that God is an invisible, eternal spirit, that is the first cause and end of all things. Spirit is the Hebrew word ruach, the same for breath, wind, and the mind. At its root, it means to breathe or to blow. The word God comes from the Hebrew word Elohim, meaning all ruling, absolute, and universal sovereign who cannot be related or compared to another, independent, and unable to be diminished in any way. It is derived from the word ul. This unused root means to twist or roll, which is by implication referring to strength and might. Strength corresponds to firmness and might is force and power. In other words, he is excellent. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Isaiah 55 and 9. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God then divided the light from the day on day one. However, light has to emanate from a source of light, and God didn't create the sun, moon, or other luminaries until day four. Consequently, there must first be light before an object can shine light. So 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 gives the source and nature of light, revealing that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. When speaking about New Jerusalem that will come down after the earth passes away, Revelation 21, 23 says this, and the city had no need for a sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Here's the understanding. Throughout scripture, God details how he spoke the world into existence with the breath of his mouth and by his word. John 1, 1, 3 explains, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. A word is a sound uttered by a living voice, which conveys an idea or concept. When a word is uttered, the speech not only conveys an idea, but the rank, authority, interest, pleasure, command, deed, and excellency of the power of the word spoken. That means that words themselves inherently contain knowledge of how a thing is come to be known. This truth is found in the laws of logic, particularly the law of identity, which states A equals A. 
Aristotle explains that each entity exists as something in particular with specific characteristics that make up what it is. Having characteristics is the meaning of existence. Because it exists as a particular thing with specific characteristics, it cannot exist as something else and therefore has no contradictions. An entity without an identity cannot exist. Although words convey pictures to our mind, they themselves are invisible, just as the spirit proceeding. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 specifically states that the word is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, validating the claims made by earlier scientists. Before a thing can exist, it must first be an idea denoting what that thing will be. Ideas can only form in the mind. That is one of the definitions of the word spirit, the mind, which God is. Furthermore, the sound of God's voice is described as a voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder, Revelations 14, 3. The word voice is the word phone, which also comes to mean bring forth into light and appear to the mind. It stems from the primitive root phos, meaning anything that emits light. This is an amazing testimony because John 1 further tells us that in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. He was the true light, which lighteth every man that comes into the world. The importance of light is that it makes the invisible things of the world manifest. It is the exact purpose of the eye, which carries the same meaning. Now the word heaven in Hebrew is shamayin, meaning lofty, referring to the sky and the abode of God. This abode is vast, covering all modes of space. God said on the second day, let there be firmament in the midst of the heaven to divide the waters above from the waters below. Daniel describes the firmament itself as being bright in Daniel 12, 3, matching the root of the word ether, which means to burn or to shine. This firmament is what God called heaven, which he said had been stretched out over the earth. The third heaven is described as the abode of God. The second heaven is the place where the celestial bodies revolve and the lower heaven is where the birds fly. Many scientists sought out to prove the ether did not exist. The Michelson-Morley experiment in 1887 is said to demonstrate that light did not require a medium for propagation after failing to detect the ether based on the control of their experiments. In 1905, Albert Einstein released his theory of special relativity to also dismiss the ether as necessary. According to his theory, light is the fastest traveling energy in the universe. He proposed that energy and mass must be the same thing since the more mass an object has, it requires that much energy to move it. However, he found that light travels at the same speed regardless of inertial frame. The only thing that could travel as fast would have to have no mass, which he called a photon. He also concluded there must not be a medium that can interfere with speed, i.e. no ether. Gravity. Thank you. Finish that for me. We're going on a journey together, you and I, today. All you eager, nubile young minds on the very cusp of adulthood. <laughs> and I shall be your consort, your guide, your chaperone into the heart of darkness. <laughs> Welcome to Astronomy 101. <laughs> For what do we know about the stars? Virgo. The Virgin. Orion, the great hunter. These are no mere twinkling diamonds for lovely maidens to wish upon. No, they are dynamos filled with a throbbing, savage, and pent-up energy. Behold the work of Albert Einstein. A professor once, like more. Energy is mass temperature. Young man, there are no questions until I've reached the climax of my lecture. I just finished your book. There's only one part. Einstein's wrong. Energy does move mass times velocity, light squared, and this dimension. What about the other 17? Nobody ever talks about the other 17. Clear example. Break down the elemental components of energy on a single constant K rate, extrapolate for each of the 14 galactic convergences that took the central prime expedition and received an echo on a signal. You wind up with a formula for interdimensional energy creation. The mass and light alone can't possibly explain. Come on, guys, I can't be the only one in the class. Young oh, man, I will not be punked. In front of the dean. No, this is my universe here. 
do you understand? I am the Alpha and the Omega. Get out of my class. Sanyak carried out a simple experiment of passing light in opposite directions around a table and recombining them. This produced interference fringes. He then rotated the whole table at two revolutions per second and found that the fringes changed. This result has very significant implications in science. It works as follows. A beam of light leaves the light source at the bottom left-hand corner and is split into two different beams which we have coloured red and blue just to distinguish them. They travel around the circuit in opposite directions until they eventually reach the splitter which also recombines them. There they then go on to the photographic plate where they have interference fringes. In this simplified version we see the beam is split into two, the red and the blue again, and they go around the circuit and are recombined at this splitter and recombining prism so that they again produce the fringes on the photographic plate. Now let us rotate the table. Before we do so, there is the very important subject of the effect of the ether. The Michelson Morley experiment failed to detect the 30 kilometers per second motion of the Earth through the ether. So as to overcome this problem, Einstein simply abolished the ether in his relativity theory. The very significant result of the Sanyak experiment was that it proved that the ether existed. Let us see how it did this. It is a fundamental feature of relativity that it claims that as there is no ether, light travels away from a source at the same speed relative to the source, whether the source is moving or not. Thus, whether the table is turning or not, the fringe patterns should stay the same. But if the ether exists, once the light has left the source, the speed of the light is controlled by the ether, independent of the speed of the table, mirrors, etc., as we see here. So let us see what happens when we rotate the table. Here, the light is split and the red and blue lights go in opposite directions. But notice that the left-hand mirror has moved around in such a direction that the distance the red light has to travel is further. Now in relativity, the same time should be taken because the splitter is also moving and the distance between them is the same. But, now imagine that the ether exists and the speed of the light is controlled by the stationary ether. Imagine the ether like a thick treacle that limits how fast the light can travel independent of the motion of the light source, the splitter or the mirrors. The result is that the red light takes longer to reach the left hand mirror. Similarly, the right hand mirror is coming towards the blue light so it reaches the mirror quicker. After they change ends, the red light again takes longer to reach the recombiner, whilst the blue light gets there quicker again. So they reach the photographic plate with a delay between them, and this changes the fringe pattern. In fact, Sanyak, using the speed of the rotation of the table, calculated how much the fringes should change and found that they did change by just that amount. The crucial feature of this experiment is that it demonstrates that the ether does exist, which demolishes relativity. How does the scientific establishment deal with this result? 
by muddying the waters with scientific gobbledygook. Wikipedia says, In the above discussion, the rotation mentioned is a rotation with respect to an inertial reference frame. Since this experiment does not involve a relativistic velocity, the same wording is valid both in the context of classical electrodynamics and special relativity. How on earth can it be valid in both theories? It clearly proves that the ether exists because the speed of the light is controlled by the ether independent of the rotating table and mirrors. This Sanyak effect is used by airlines for their compass directions. As the plane turns, the change in the fringes are translated into a change in the direction of the plane that then registers on the cockpit compass. In addition, I have received comments from two scientists complaining that they were never taught about the Sanyak experiment. In 1920, Einstein recanted that statement, instead conceiving that space without ether was unthinkable after finding space had physical properties like the ability to bend. In the general theory of relativity, he demonstrates that time is linked to matter and space. They must come into being at precisely the same instant. Since time itself cannot exist in the absence of matter and space, which is length plus width plus height, it was considered the fourth dimension. Space wasn't a flat, unchanging absolute entity. Rather, it's woven together along with time into a single fabric called space-time. This fabric is continuous, smooth, and gets curved and deformed by the presence of matter and energy. What is again interesting is that Scripture 2 describes the ether as four-dimensional. In Isaiah 34, 4, prophesying the heavens will be rolled together as a scroll. Scripture also speaks to the heavens being stretched out like a tent with the ability to be torn in Isaiah 64, 1. This is precisely the condition scientists say create the mysterious black hole, as the fabric is stretched too far. Scientists are presumably monitoring two black holes they say will eventually collide, causing the fabric of space-time to be shaken. Whether their words in this instance are hyperbole, I'm not sure. Scientists also agree with Psalms 102:26, which describe the heavens being worn out like a garment. It's no debate that time and universe is coming to an end. Some theories claim demise by Hawking radiation, where the expansion of space will cool the energy nearly to zero Kelvin or absolute zero, signaling the heat death of the universe and total entropy, called the Big Freeze. Others claim the expanding universe will eventually rip, causing gravity to be shaken, stars to crash into one another, matter to dissolve, which will eventually reveal infinity. What does scripture say? And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casts his untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Revelation 6, 13, 14. Second Peter 3, 10 through 13 states, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of god wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness if you are familiar with scripture, then you know this is when the people of God live with him forever in eternity. Astrophysicist Russell Humphrey, which I had the pleasure to hear speak in person, giving a great talk about the heavens, wrote a great article, also pointing to the fact that scientists use the words continuum, quantum field theory, quantum vacuum, manifold, substratum, and plunum as code words for the ether.